Hello, my name is Dr. Marty Martin, and I'm Director and Associate Professor here at DePaul University in the City of Chicago. I'm also direct and focus on the Health Sector Management MBA program, which is in the College of Business. What I want to talk about are some quantitative management in healthcare. So it may seem like kind of a kind of a topic, but hopefully what you'll find is that it's quite interesting, not only interesting, but very practical in terms of both the design and the delivery of care. So first, let me begin with some basics. First, what is healthcare management? So it's the management of both processes as well as systems that provide care to patients. It also involves many different decision tools and techniques that you have to bring to the table to enhance quality, maybe contain costs, and improve your processes. So speaking of decisions, there are many different decisions that are involved in healthcare management. Some are forecasting. So if there's the cold or flu season, can we anticipate how many patients may come to the outpatient setting or to the emergency department? Capacity planning. So as the population gets older and older, do we have enough beds? And staffing and scheduling. Are there enough nurses and physicians and lab techs to accommodate new patients? And how do we manage medical supplies? The last thing you want to happen is a shortage, particularly when you're doing a procedure or you're, or you're operating on someone. And also quality control. Not only do we have to be concerned about productivity and resource utilization and throughput, but we really want to make sure that care is provided in a safe and high quality fashion. And fundamentally, we have to make sure that we motivate employees to deliver care in a way that's safe, high quality, and satisfying and affordable. So decision making really is the key when you think about quantitative aspects in healthcare management. And there are really two types of decisions. One involves systems design. So that's both facilities, it's also about processes as well, as well as your selection systems. The second is systems operation. So how do you, once you design your healthcare delivery system, how do you make sure it runs smoothly and operates in a way that achieves high quality, safe care, satisfying care at a low cost? So let's walk through a structured decision-making process that can apply to systems design as well as systems operation. First, clearly define the problem and the factors that influence it. Now when you define the problem, you don't define it just once. You define it again and again and you get input from others. You don't want to jump to a premature conclusion if you haven't defined the problem in the proper way. Second, Develop specific goals to be achieved to close that gap. Because remember, you've identified the problem, now you want to either eliminate that problem or get close to eliminating it by setting some goals. Three, develop some quantitative measures that relate to the goals. So let's say, for example, our problem is, is that our patient satisfaction, as measured by a tool like Press Ganey, is at the 75th percentile. Now we know that we have about a 25 percentile gap, so what we want to do is set a goal. So we're currently at the 75th percentile, so our goal may to achieve patient satisfaction at the 98th percentile, so we want to set a quantitative metric. Four, we want to develop alternative solutions to actually reducing this gap. Do we hire different employees? Do we change our compensation system? Do we train them in a different way? Do we reset expectations with patients? So all those are possibilities. And five, we want to compare those different possibilities and then really come up with number six, the best alternative. But we don't know it's the best alternative until we actually, number seven, implement it. So hopefully you can see through this example, this is a structured decision-making process. You can do it as an individual, which I wouldn't encourage you, or you can do it with a group. That I would encourage you to do. Now this next slide is a nice kind of a framework for you. It's called the House of Decision Making. So what I'd like you to do is just kind of pause and take a look at it. And if you note on the very bottom of that, the foundation is data. You want to make sure you have data. But with any data that you have, what are your assumptions? Is it reliable, consistent? Is it valid? Does it actually measure what it's purported to measure? Then once you have that data, you have to put it in some type of model or framework so that way you can make sense of it. 
And then once you have the data, you've articulated your assumptions, you've put it into a model or framework, then you have to analyze it. And then you often ask, ask yourself a question. Yep, or you have an objective. And then you move up into the pillars of analysis, and four of them are outlined there. And then at the very top, at the apex, if you will, you have how to make the decision. So that's called the house of decision making. I would encourage you to separate that slide out, blow it up, and as you make decisions, not only in your professional life, but also in your personal life, go back to that. I'm sure you'll find it to be quite useful. Now we all would like to make very good decisions, but there's some barriers that have been purported in the scientific literature to good decision making. There are actually four that I'm going to talk about. The first one is around framing the question. So framing is, is the way in which you ask the question, you get a different response. Let me give you a case in point. There was recently a survey that was done, I think it was by Gallup or Pew or one of these polling houses, and they went on the street and they asked individuals these two questions. So the same individual. They said, excuse me, ma'am or sir, I have a question for you. Yep, are you in favor of Obamacare? And many of the respondents said, no, I'm not in favor of Obamacare. And then they asked the same individual, excuse me, ma'am, sir, are you in favor of the Affordable Care Act? Yes, I'm in favor of the Affordable Care Act. So it's framing, because the Affordable Care Act equals Obamacare. So the way the question was asked in one way, they were opposed, but it was asked in another way, they were in favor of it. So be very careful about how you frame things. The second barrier is gathering intelligence. So before you actually define the problem, before you come up with the solutions, you want to use a technique that you're all familiar with called brainstorming. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So when you think about brainstorming, it's gathering as much information as possible, even information that's contrary to your initial point of view. That's important because you don't want to just get information that confirms your point of view. That's the echo chamber. What you want to do is get information that may contradict your point of view. So now let's look at the third barrier, coming to conclusions. It should really say kind of jumping to conclusions prematurely. So in this kind of time pressured world, we want to be able to identify the problem, solve the problem, and move on to the next problem. So let's be time sensitive, let's be efficient, let's be quick. Okay, all that is good, but you don't want to be efficient and not effective. So don't prematurely jump to a solution where you really don't understand the problem. The last one, failing to learn from feedback. Yep. So you go through this structured decision-making process that we talked about, and then you find out later, because it's only later, yep, that the decision wasn't so good. So go back and analyze so that way you can improve it. The only way you can improve your decision-making is to critically analyze what made that decision good, and maybe what made that decision not so good, and what can I do in the future to make that change. So I hope at the end of this particular segment that you have a good understanding of why decision making is important in healthcare, the seven steps to structured decision making, and the four barriers to good decision making. Now we're going to present a number of different tools beginning with brainstorming. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Dr. Marty Martin at DePaul University in the Health Sector Management MBA program.